A fantastic show is on deck, and we'll begin with a conversation with the CEO of Our Lady of the Lake. Roll it, Kirk. Well, it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, a great, great cause, and I think it's one of the best things we do unified as a society. And here's Chuck Spicer, the CEO of Our Lady of the Lake, a big old uh, hospital and children's hospital here. But let's start with Breast Cancer Awareness Month <clears throat> and the work that you're doing at Mary Bird Perkins and everything else that's happening in the hospital. Where are we now with that work? Well, thanks. Good to see you as always. Yeah. Um, glad to have a little splash of pink on my lapel. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, I think part of what you just said was uh, it is a community. It's partnerships. Yep. We had an active partnership with Mary Bird Perkins. We have an active partnership, including Mary Bird with Women's Hospital. Yep. We have sites at St. Elizabeth and Gonzales in Livingston. We in North Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. we deploy technology to make sure we capture breast, ca breast cancer before it's a real problem. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it takes all of us working together, as you said. I think the messaging behind early screenings, keeping up with <clears throat> your health regimen and also just the messaging about how you can overcome this it does not have to be the death sentence it once was has all been effective what's on the horizon as we continue to attack this horrible horrible disease? I think getting uh, getting closer and quicker to the patient yeah it's a, if it's a mobile screening at their place of work uh, making sure their annual primary care appointments are more than that it's there's a regiment around getting screened and, and taken care of uh, with a mam mammogram uh, there's enough technology out there. We just have to make sure we get it closer to the patient. Our Lady of the Lake turns 100 years old next month. Turns 101. 101, 101 next month. The Children's Hospital turns five years old this month. That's right. Let's talk first about the lake. 100 years of serving the capital region. Highlights and then where are we going for the next 100? Well, I, I think that it all was set in motion by a group of sisters from Calais, France, getting on a boat and traversing through the North Atlantic in 1913, yeah. which wasn't a great cruising time for the North Atlantic. I imagine not. But had a great vision for bring, bringing the healing ministry of Jesus Christ to Louisiana. And there's a picture of them yeah. early on. That's the lake. Yeah. Uh, and we just try to continue that. I think uh, the milestones are how we broaden the reach across the region from North Baton Rouge to Assumption Parish. Now we're involved with angels in Bogalusa. Mm -hmm. How do we get, like, as we've talked about with breast cancer, how do we get closer to the patient? We have the, the most specialized care, arguably, in the state at yeah. the Regional Medical Center. We have children's care, partnership with Children's New Orleans. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've proven that it's not just going to be done on our own. It's going to be done with partners in the community. But we have some great medicine practiced by great physicians in Baton Rouge. Unbelievably happy to be here. I've been here now almost two years. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> one of the first things... Chuck did when he came here as he reached out to members of the community. You and I had lunch and uh, we actually went out to an area where a project I'm volunteering with is gonna stand. And you and I talked about how the lake is so unique because you can have one of the wealthiest people mm -hmm. in the capital region in one room next to someone from a disinvested community in the other room and they receive the same level they, of they, care. They need to receive the same care. And that that's as prevalent and, and uh, true today as it was when we talked that, that yeah, day yeah. a few months back. I, I think how do we make sure they don't get in the hospital is still part of the overall goal, but how do we, when they get there, we have the care uh, there for them. We have a lot of projects in Livingston and North Baton Rouge mm -hmm. to keep people closer to home, mm -hmm. but we know that people get sick, yeah. and we want to make sure the regional is ready when they do get sick. The Children's Hospital, one of the great things that uh, I've seen happen here in Baton Rouge, I get a sense of pride when I'm on the interstate and I see that building there because of what it represents. Talk about the value of the Children's Hospital of this and the communities around it. Well, I, I've been a part of Children's Health Care the, the, really the majority of my career now. I never can imagine not. If you've ever been in a Children's Hospital and you see the kids, you can't help but look at and see your own child's face on the patient in the hospital. This was something that was dreamed you know, years ago when I was able to inherit the, the vision of a lot of people mm -hmm. and now hopefully do something with it. We have a state-of-the-art facility. We have a partnership with Children's New Orleans. Uh, we have surgical care, cancer care, emergency care, which is this boon. We're going to probably tip 50,000 visits on our children's ER wow. only this year. We have great leadership uh, through our physician leaders, our administrative leaders, uh, Jonathan Brooke, Sean Kimberly, uh, 
great team. It, it makes my job easy. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a great value to the region. I remember talking with George Bell about this, and he said it's something that we should support because we want it to stay here. We want it to thrive. Um, one of the things that the lake has, has done so well is your partnership with LSU. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's tough sometimes yeah. to go to the field at yeah. LSU game when I'm a Texas fan. <laughs> um, but I fight through it. You know, it, it's, okay. it, you know I, I joke about that. I was, as you know, was at OU for yeah. 17 years they're as a come, Texas fan. They're coming here for a beat down, too, this oh, year. Oh, believe me. They're the big, biggest LSU fan you've ever seen that Saturday. Uh, the way LSU partners has yeah. been incredible yeah. uh, about how we take care of their community, how we work together with the – their trainees at LSU uh, comes out of some of them come out of New Orleans. Some of them uh, finish their training here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's been a great partnership. I couldn't say enough about President Tate, uh, Kevin Reed, who's a yeah. local leader of the phys physician group. Uh, Katie, as you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, Katie's moved into academic role. It's it's been uh, probably the biggest satisfier of again moving here is to see that effective partnership you know I want you to come back at some point and do my podcast upstairs so we can talk a little bit longer about your background in healthcare, but also how intensely focused you are on making certain that all sectors of communities are touched by good health care and, and, and like I said we had a long conversation about it I got about 30 seconds quickly what's your number one goal for 2025 the next hundred years we, we have a strategic plan that we started last year that will have a session with our board on Monday mm -hmm. to really chart the path for the next hundred years. We have an ambitious plan. We have a lot of places to be. How do we effective, effectively be where we need to be, meet people where they're at? Uh, we have a, a lot of big ambitions and dreams. I love it. Chuck Spicer, CEO of Our Lady of the Lake. Maxine Crump is up next. See you in a second. Thanks, man. Maxine Crump is with Dialogue on Race. This thing has been going on for a little while, a series of discussions that delve into the way that we relate as a society, particularly as it deals with race, some of the doors that have been kept closed and some of the doors that have opened because of dialogues about race. So and she's a veteran of television, so she knows her way around the studio as well. This studio, this in studio, fact. in <laughs> fact. Um, let's begin at the beginning for someone who may be recently here and does not know about Dialogue on Race. What is it? It's Dialogue on Race is the program of Dialogue on Race Louisiana, mm -hmm. and the program is a series of conversations um, that are backed with factual material, formatted, mm -hmm. and facilitated to offer a space for supportive conversation around race, institutional and systemic races, race, racism in particular. Mm -hmm. What are the goals? The goals are to help people be able to talk about race. Do you know they don't? Yeah. Because it's uncomfortable yeah. and um, it ends up being divisive and conversations of debate and things like that. So it's to help people talk about it. Mm -hmm. Race is a fact of this country. Yes. It's, what, it's how it's set up. Mm -hmm. And if it's that important to have this set up and to keep it set up and institutionalize it, then we need to be able to talk about it. This is our country. So yeah. that's the goal, so that we can talk about it. I believe people cannot effectively remove certain systems that have existed for decades. You do. Until they appreciate that these systems have been there and they are the, they are directly connected to some of the realities in our communities and some of these systems were put in race because of racial racial biases that existed decades ago do you find enlightenment from some of the people who come into the room and say we don't have a race problem and then they learn yes there are some things we can do better yes they come in the room saying that because just what you said they don't know that's a systemic setup from the founding this country set up race as its construct and institutionalized in all institutions. Now, there have been many um, measures put in place to make things better, to yeah. roll back some of the discrimination, yeah. but they've been laws, but they have not been enforced mm -hmm. as laws. They're only enforced if you take it to court, which isn't really enforcing. That's not, you, that's not how you enforce traffic. Right. It's a law. You obey the law. There's a monitoring system that we have, uh, and it's called policing, and yeah. then when you are uh, found to be liable in, in traffic, you get fined. Mm -hmm. When it comes to racism, the individual who, who has been wronged has to prove that it has happened and then take it to court. So that's what I mean by there is, there's a lack of enforcement. So the laws are not strong and therefore the system continues. 
Yeah, I think this is one of the most courageous things to happen here, and you've been doing it for some time. And hearing about it, Carolyn Coleman and I were chatting about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, what has been the most enlightened moment you've observed in these dialogues? That people say, oh, I didn't realize that. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it that way. When they say that, I get chills because mm -hmm. I know that probably they've been wondering for a long time, what am I looking at? Mm -hmm. What's the problem here? Something's wrong. They know that. And then when they come into the conversation, they have these moments that say, I get it now. I see something I didn't see before. And sometimes they actually say it changes their lives. That sounds that. strong to me, but they do say that. The most disappointing thing you've noticed or observed? That people want to convince me that this isn't needed. <laughs> this conversation is not needed. We'll try. Okay. And when they do, I just say, okay, well, that's one way of looking at it. See, you're already I have nothing see, else on you're that. You're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to come get you to do the podcast so we can really talk about that. All right, I have, I have a minute left for people who want to get involved or participate in one of the conversations. Because if you go to the website and you see the crowd, you have a, an extremely diverse group of people sitting Indeed. for the discussion. Mm -hmm. How can someone participate in one of them? First off, know that you can, and it, the, everyone's voice is valued mm -hmm. in there. And they just go to the website, Dialogue on Race Louisiana, and there's a registration page and a donate page as well. We're well, a nonprofit. Look, I think these kinds of things are courageous but necessary. Indeed. Pretending a problem isn't there will never solve the problem. Right. Dialogue on Race Louisiana, the veteran of media, Maxine Crump. You're, just, you're such a natural doing this stuff, and it's good to see you. Listen, I want to get you to do the podcast so we can talk longer and yes. really dig into some of the realities sure. about this. But You'll it. come back and do it? I will. All right, up next, let's talk about what's happening in education here in East Baton Rouge Parish. And you can catch the show every Friday, streams on WAFB.com, and Friday nights on WAFB+, Plus. replaying Saturday at 3 p.m. Really loving this episode so far, and it's going to get even better. Mm -hmm. Dwan Johnson with Madison Preparatory Academy is here. Mm -hmm. And we were in a conversation maybe three weeks ago talking about the work CSAL and some of the campuses mm -hmm. are doing as it relates to addressing education. And I found it so refreshing to listen to your very old school <laughs> way of approaching getting kids to be involved and building a sense of family at your school. So uh, first of all, welcome. And then let's Thank talk you. about your definition of a healthy school campus environment. Well, uh, as we discussed uh, several weeks ago, uh, like we say, we, uh, Mr. Cole, who's superintendent, yeah. and I were having this conversation, and it, and the thing we said, we wanted old-fashioned school. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and of course, that's where our parents are involved, our teachers are involved, uh, our, our school administrators become the parents of the campus. Right. And, and things such as that, and, um, and to a great degree, we've been able uh, to achieve that, particularly at our brick and mortar campuses. When it comes to behavioral issues and how you address them, I mean, it's not like it was 25, 30 years ago where there were <laughs> capital punishment is all is way <laughs> gone now. How do you maintain discipline and respect for you and your staff in 2024, the way kids think and operate? Well, we, we start off trying to have dialogue mm -hmm. uh, with our students early on, um, early in the year, early in the day right uh, every morning we start our each of our campuses off with what we call community meeting mm -hmm. and so we'll sit and we'll talk uh, with our students and we'll kind of uh, go through uh, you know it, the expectations for the day uh, any potential disturbances or or whatever the case may be and so we have those conversations with them and so they they pretty much know what to expect uh, each and every day Philosophically, man, why do you believe there are so many instances where families now, uh, some parents nowadays show up at campus not wanting to understand what the child may or may not have done, <laughs> but strictly coming in there to attack? Because we've had instances where there's been brawls mm -hmm. on campuses between parents and students. You guys mm -hmm. don't have that kind of foolishness, but what? W where does that come from? Because I don't understand it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a societal change, yeah. you know, where, where uh, I, unfortunately, a lot of times you have a lot of parents with uh, a lack of parenting skills themselves, mm -hmm. and so all they know is, you know, what they're used to doing, and, uh, and so you have to work with them also yeah. to kind of help them to unlearn 
uh, some of those things that they're accustomed to. And not that our campuses are perfect, of course, well, and we do yeah. have our own, uh, our own trials, but at the same time, by and large, by having these conversations, uh, we've been able to avert a lot of the major blowups. Uh, getting kids to stay committed to learning, to use education as a tool mm -hmm. uh, to get them to where their dreams are. What's your philosophy on being effective at that? Well, early on, you know, unfortunately, a, a lot of the campuses now have uh, kindergarten through 12th grade uh, offerings, and, and, and we do too. So if we can start communicating early on, and, and not only that, providing them with meaningful examples and realistic ones at mm -hmm. that. A lot of times I think what happens is, it, because we live in such a, a, a instant gratification type of society. A little bit. <laughs> that, you know, the children don't see the reality or the manifestation uh, of what we are, we're, we're trying to instill in them. And so we try to make incremental games, mm -hmm. uh, talk to them constantly, uh, put people and put experiences in front of them. Yeah. that will help them kind of incrementally grow until ultimately they, they, they reach their goals. How do we get more, uh, candidly spoken, more black men in education to be in classrooms in front of these kids? Well, that's tough, you know, because as we know, education is not always the most lucrative endeavor. <laughs> not always. No. When has it been? <laughs> when has it been? <laughs> yeah. but, but at the same time, um, a rewarding experience, uh, there's no more rewarding experience yeah. than seeing how you can impact a child's life. And so when we can communicate that uh, to potential teachers, mm -hmm. uh, we've been fortunate hiring a lot of our young men back yeah. and some of our young ladies yeah. too. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I want you to come back and bring some kids with you. All right. All right. All right. Juan Johnson with Madison Prep. Mm -hmm. Let's talk mm -hmm. about a young man who's involving himself in the artistry of the leaf. You'll meet him next. And the C-Suite, currently airing on the C-Suite, is my interview with former BRPD Chief Murphy Paul. Next week, Matt Moscona talking football. Oh, look at that right there. <laughs> Maven Cigars, and I'm talking about uh, a great gift for the greatest holiday on the planet, Father's Day. You can start uh, thinking about that right now. I think that uh, Alyssa and... Courtney are going to be uh, bringing these out to us on Father's Day. I needed to say that on television. And I'm going to need some protection when I go back to uh, Master Control, if you don't mind. All right, Austin, what's going on, man? I know. Th this is so interesting. You started a cigar company with your partner, and you've got uh, three types of cigars. I got a chance to try one of them at an event we were together at uh, the other day. And I'll begin at the beginning. How did you get into the cigar industry, young man? Yes, sir. It's actually a very nice story, me and my brother. So especially during the pandemic, we were trying to get back and feel some type of normalcy. Yeah. Um, there's this park that we have in Austin called Zilker. We would go there, sit there, have, you know, some some nice cigars, yeah. talk about life, talk about our goals and aspirations. Yeah. And it became a weekly thing. And we started to develop a love for cigars, the labels, the boxes, yeah, yeah. how they smoked, the wrappers, the binders, and starting to really understand the product and understand that we really, really love this. And this is something that we were like, you know what? Why not give it a chance? Why not take a shot? And Look, yeah. I knew you knew what you were talking about when you were talking about wrapper, <laughs> filler, binder, and regions like Condega and all. I said, okay, this boy's versed in this stuff. So let's talk about these particular offerings uh, and this one, which you, you told me the, is the strongest one. Yes. It's a little Torpedo Robusto here. Yep. Tell me a little bit about it. Yes, so we have our three cigar lines here. This is going to be our Pimeria, our boldest cigar line. My brother designed this one because he is from Nicaragua, so he wanted this cigar to reflect him as well. So you see that in the cigar. So again, 52 by 5, Robusto, Torpedo. The wrapper is going to be a nice Sumatra Oscura. The binder is going to be Nicaraguan Jalapa, and the filler is going to be Nicaraguan Condega, Jalapa, and Omatepe. Three Nicaraguan tobaccos makes a very bold cigar for a bold lover. Pyramide Fina. 
right there. <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about this one. Yes. Uh huh. This is going to be our best seller. This is Tiempo 211 cigar that I designed because I normally like the more medium cigar smoke. Okay. So this is going to have a Habana Rosado on the wrapper. The binder is going to be Indonesian, so it's going to have a wider ash whenever you're smoking it. And then also for the filler, it's going to be Nicaraguan Condega and Dominican. So if you're pairing this with something wine, whiskey, tequila, coffee in the morning, reading the newspaper, pairs wonderfully with that because it doesn't overpower with whatever you're drinking. I love this. And by the way, they are not sponsors of the show. There's no money changing. <laughs> hands. <laughs> I'm just very impressed with these young men being involved with something so uh, so wonderful in the artistry of this stuff. Now tell us about this last one. Now this is going to be Platino. This is our premium cigar line. Very braggadocious, big 56 by 6.5 <laughs> cigar. If you're on the golf course, you want to show off a little bit, that is the oh, best man. one to do it. Exactly. It looks great oh, in your hand, too. So it's going to have the shaggy foot on the bottom as well. And then also, it's going to have Mexican San Andreas in the filler as opposed to the wrapper. Really? Yes. Usually people use this for the wrapper. We want it to have a nice nuance of flavor and put it in the filler. So for this, the wrapper is going to be a nice sumate med. The binder is going to be Nicaraguan Jalapa. And the filler is going to be Nicaraguan Condega and the Mexican San Andreas. And it also takes you on a journey while you're smoking it as well. The the first fourth is going to be a little more smooth because of the Condega and the uh, Mexican San Andreas is in and then the second fourth is going to be a little more bold. Then the third fourth is going to go back to more smooth. Last fourth fin finish a little bit more bold. How cigars do. Listen, I'm going to tell you for a lot of people it just sounded like he was speaking French. <laughs> but if you have a cigar <laughs> smoker in your life, they understood it all and it's great. Okay, I got, I got about a minute. Where can people learn about Mayfin? Yes, so you can find us at MayfinCigars.com or you go on Instagram, Mayfin underscore cigars. That's M-A-Y-F-I-N underscore cigars. We are launching a little bit of a new project next month, and it could involve cigars. And so I might invite you all out for a longer discussion about getting into this. Congratulations to you and what you guys are doing. This is great work. One of the oldest forms of artistry mm -hmm. on the planet mm -hmm. is a cigar. So thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate you having me. All right. So next week, we'll talk a little bit about what Helix Academy has been accomplishing. And the police chief has a youth advisory council, and some of those young people will join us on the show next week and we're getting closer to that political period we'll talk about that catch the c-suite again matt muscone is going to be our guest we're going to talk about lsu football southern football and uh, the nfl here's where you can catch me on the socials y'all have a great weekend enjoy that weather